The long-awaited Python 3.12 was released today, and I can tell you already that Python has become even more powerful. One of the new features can be even a real game changer. I'll show you the most important features directly in the code. So the first feature is the syntactical formalization of f strings. So what's new here is that you can now nest strings. As you can see, here is an f string, and here is a double quote, and there is a single quote. In Python 3.11, this quote here would escape the string. So this would be one string, and this would lead to a syntax error. But in Python 3.12, this is now a nested string. So this are the double quotes around this string, and then you need single quotes, and for one layer deeper, you need double quotes again. So you can nest your strings deeper than just one level. So to demonstrate this, let's run it in Python 3.11 first. And here you can see we get a syntax error. And if you run it in Python 3.12, this will now work fine. Yeah, this works. The second improvement are improved error messages. So if we don't import this, we get a name error. And here we get a hint, name is not defined. Did you forget to import this? So we get a hint what's wrong in our code. The next new feature is using type dict for more precise quarks typing. So what's new is in Python 3.11, you could only have quarks with one data type annotated. And normally when you have more complex types, you have, for example, here an integer for age and a string for first name and last name. This annotating that was not possible with Python 3.11. What you can do now is you can define your own data type, which inherits from type dict and use unpack here uh, for annotating the quarks. And what you want to unpack is this person class. So that's pretty useful if you used aesthetic type checking. Okay, the next feature is syntax warning for invalid escape sequences. For example, if you have this invalid escape sequence in the string, you now can try and catch a syntax warning in Python 3.11 this was not possible. I would say rather an edge case, but maybe quite helpful in one or the other case. So the next feature is comprehension inlining. So for every list comprehension, it actually changes nothing in the code. So you don't have to learn anything new, but the performance of a list comprehension or any other comprehension has now doubled in most cases. I'll show you why. So here we are at the PEP 709 inline comprehensions. And as you can see here is a bytecode visualization. So what happens is the bytecode for comprehension is in a separate code object. And every time a function is called, a new single use function object is allocated. So uh, this is now allocating and then destroying a new frame on the Python stack and is then immediately thrown away. So this is quite some overhead. And with the new pep, the compiler will emit the following bytecode. And as you can see, there is no separate code object. So these are two objects and this is one object. And this is why the code is in most cases twice as fast now. So this is not a claim by me. This is here in the documentation mentioned. Here it is. This speeds up execution of a comprehension by up to two times. So pretty insane if these numbers are actually true. Okay, let's go to the next features and this is hashable slice objects. So what is actually a slice? I guess many of you have not seen that at all. Slice creates a slice object and you can use that slice object here like the normal indexing. For example, I want to index here the first element of that list and you can also index the second element by one, two and three and so on and you start with zero. You can also use the slice for this and what's happening here is that we start with the first element here, so index one, and we go to the seventh element and we use a step size of two. So if we, for example, do this and set this to eight and maybe this to three, so you can guess now what happens. So we start with three. Now we go to eight, all up to eight, and the step size is one. So we get three, four, five, six, and seven. And now in Python 3.12, you can use that slice object and set it as key in a dictionary. I can show you in Python 3.11, this led to an error because the slice object is not hashable and you can only store hashable obje objects as key in a dictionary because the key in a dictionary 
is never allowed to change. So the slice object in 3.12 is now immutable, so you can set it as key in a dictionary. Okay, let's go to the next feature. And now we get in Python what other languages already have as generic. So let's say we've got a max function and we are allowed to pass in an iterable. So if we only had a string, an integer or float, we could do it like this with iterable and then union str int and float. So this would work for this data type. But what if you want to allow any data type inside that iterable? So we can right now create a generic data type with type var, we pass in a name and then use this variable here as generic data type. So we can use it here and also return it. But yeah, there's a better way now. So the new way to create a generic is the following. So you create your function definition and now in square brackets, you pass in your generic data type. So you call it, for example, T. So best practice is to use a single letter and uppercase and you pass that generic data type, which you defined here, here as type annotation inside the function arguments. And you can of course also return it. Right now in VS Code, you can see there's a little bit of syntax highlighting error, but it works just fine when I run it. So no syntax error or anything, just um, a little bit in VS Code issue. So I think this is a pretty nice new feature because most other languages, for example, TypeScript, allow that and also do it in the same way. Okay, another cool and new feature are variables in target comprehensions. So for example, you have this list comprehension, which gives you back a list with some values. I'm gonna show you the values. Let's comment that out or remove it. And now you can see here are zero, two, four, six, and eight. So I guess nothing new. But now if you want to filter the result, you have to do the following. So you get this iterable from that list comprehension and you have to use it again to now filter values which are larger than five. So you can do that of course and this will result in six and eight. In Python 3.12, you can now do that in a single function call. So here in this new syntax, you can use the Walrus operator to assign this y variable on the fly. So you calculate this and assign it to y and now check on the fly if that's larger than five. And you can use the y value directly in that list comprehension. So this is a more concise syntax, maybe a little bit more complex, but it results in the same values at the end. Okay, let's go to the next feature and this is the override decorator. And this is the feature I really like. So for example, you've got a base class, an animal class, and you want to override the functionality make sound in the child class. So you can now use the override decorator to first tell the developer that this method overrides a method from a base class and also use that in a static type checker like MyPy. So if you make an error here, so for example, if you use override, but the method you want to override is not implemented in the base class, it will now throw an error. So that won't happen here because it's only type annotation. But if we try that from the terminal, so let's try this. I created here a script and this is the same functionality as before. So if we call myPy and then script.py, we can now see that this results in error. So I think this is very helpful for me as a developer and also here for static type checking to prevent some error and unexpected behavior. I've got one last feature and this might be quite big. And this is how Python now handles the global interpreter lock. For those who don't know, the global interpreter lock, so-called JIL, is a mutex that protects access to Python objects, preventing multiple native threads from executing Python bytecode at once, which is necessary because the C Python's memory management is not thread safe. Due to the global interpreter lock, even though Python supports multithreading with its own module, only one thread can execute Python bytecode once at a time, which means the CPU bound tasks cannot be executed across multiple CPU cores at once because the JIL prevents this. And this is quite some bottleneck in Python. But in Python, there exist so-called sub interpreters and they now can be created with a unique global interpreter lock 
per interpreter. And this now allows Python programs to take full advantage of multiple CPU cores. Unfortunately, that is only available in Python 3.12 uh, with the CPython API, but not yet in the Python API. So this is how it can be achieved in C code. And to be honest, I'm not a C expert. I'm far away from that. And I will wait until it's implemented in Python natively. So this is how it will look like. As you can see, this will of course not work because it's not implemented. It's just some sort of code and you will get your own interpreters module. You will create your own interpreter, your sub interpreter, and then you can use run and use a sub interpreter to run your code. And at the end, you will just close that interpreter. And for threading, which is the most important part here, you can use the threading module and now use interpreter and then the run method and pass it as target to the threading module. So this should allow native multi-threading in Python. So I'm very excited for that feature, but we have to wait around one year until Python 3.13 comes out. So yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching. See you. Bye-bye.